reintroduction on uh, last week, I think both days we took a reintroduction looking at rotational motion. Now we're going to go to general motion, which is a step beyond the stuff we did in Physics 1. I told you it was kind of Physics 1 advanced, and here's where part of that is advanced. We're going to look at not just translational motion that we started the class with and started physics one with. We're not going to look just at the rigid body rotational motion. That's where we ended up in uh, physics one. Actually, we did the kinetics of rotational motion. But now we're going to look at the kinematics of general motion, which is the two of those Together, the fact that things can rotate and translate at the same time, of course, is a, a little more realistic than, than just one or the other in terms of getting uh, a big picture of the things that are doing going on. Uh, we're going to do this in two flavors. The first is uh, as an absolute motion analysis. That's what we're going to do here. Uh, for the first part of today. Uh, in that, we uh, define the constraints which means uh, come to understand just where and where cannot this object move. For example, if we're looking at a, a common car tire rolling down the road, which is clearly an, an example of translation and rotation at the same time, one of the constraints is that the tire has to follow the roadway. It can't go into the roadway, and as long as we're not looking at any, any kind of major bounce of any kind, it won't leave the roadway. So the constraint is that it would follow the roadway. Then we'll look uh, right after that at relative motion analysis. And this is where we uh, use the fact that uh, any points on these objects are uh, an equidistant apart so that if we know the motion of one point on the object we can use that to find the motion of some other part point on the object because of the relative motion between the two. So we, we, we might get to that today, it depends on how how things go today. We have lots of detailed drawing to do. So as we start getting into these, uh, the first couple sketches aren't any big deal, but uh, after that uh, we're going to have some pretty good detailed drawings. We'll make them kind of big when we get started. All right, so for the absolute motion analysis uh, that we'll start with, we want to do uh, a couple things with it. Generally what we do is uh, establish the known path of a point. This is one of the critical pieces of putting the absolute motion together. For example, uh, if we take the very simple idea of an, a wheel rolling on, the, on a road, it's fairly clear, I hope, that the center must follow a straight line. That's due to the constraint of the wheel maintaining its size. Remember, this is rigid body studies, so the wheel is not going to change size. Uh, so this uh, is due to the constraint that the center of the wheel must follow a path that's parallel to the roadway itself. Once we've established uh, something about the position um, we'll find S as a function of either, uh, either angular position of the wheel or a uh, function of time and then from that we're going to establish then um, the velocity and acceleration of the wheel 
and of any of the points on the wheel that we might need to find, for, depending on whatever the problem is. All right, so that's, that's our general picture, uh, a little bit more specific of how we're going to do this, and then we'll start in on the real picture of just what this is going to involve. Imagine we have a wheel here. We'll label that initial point of the center as G. It's in contact with the ground a distance uh, R away. Maybe we'll label that initial contact point A. And then some little bit of time later, and I'm kind of exaggerating it because I've got to fit everything in here. The wheels rolled to that spot. So G has moved here to some place we can call G prime. A will have moved to some other place. Um, I don't know where I could, you know, depending on what the what the distance is, maybe A prime up there. And that will mean that our radius marker went through an angle of theta. And because of the arc length, we can uh, identify how far it rolled because uh, it rolled a distance that was represented by this much of the track. And that's a distance uh, r theta when theta is in radians. And so that, that's the kind of thing we're going to do. Only we'll be a little bit more specific with it. Uh, that's just a general idea. So our first step will be to identify the position uh, as a function of theta. And that's going to involve this idea of arc length, s equals r theta. Now, uh, with just saying that, there's a very, very important idea that's here, but it follows through that the other parts that we're going to do, because then we'll take the derivative of that to find the velocity, which will also be a function of theta, but because of the time varying nature of theta, that will also be a function of time or theta dot, which is omega. So we'll relate uh, s with theta, s dot with omega, and then of course we'll find uh, acceleration, s double dot, and uh, that'll be a function of alpha and uh, all the other little parts will come into a theta. Um, so we'll have these three concurrent ideas as well. Those three simple little things there are absolutely crucial to everything we're going to do. Uh, but they're also so simple that um, I could probably not even mention them and it would, uh, it, things would still work okay. What these th three things together are called is the uh, no-slip condition. Those do not apply if there's any slippage at all between the wheel and the road. So we've got to maintain those. Uh, for the most part, it's nothing more than us saying well, it's nothing more than us using these relations any time uh, that immediately establishes the no-slip condition. But uh, they also are, are inherently defined if we happen to have a gear running along a, uh, a toothed uh, rack, a gear and, uh, rack and pinion type situ uh, system. Uh, because gears, by definition, don't slip. We used that the other day 
when we uh, had that belt uh, running around the pulleys, we had to assume that those pulley, those belts were not slipping on the pulleys. If they were slipping, then there's uh, velocities between the two, and we can't establish all the pieces to that uh, with our, at least our first steps through that. Uh, maybe we'd have to take a more complex analysis with it. All right, so we're going to start this picture over again and make it quite a bit larger. Not happy enough with that one. We can do better. All right, so there's, there's our initial position. We're going to establish a couple things. Uh, uh, one of the things we need to do is, here is, one, we identify the constraints. In this case, it's the constraint that the center has to follow a horizontal line parallel to the roadway itself. Uh, that's an easier condition than using the roadway itself as the constraint because no one point is always on the roadway as the wheel rolls, there's a different point on the roadway at all times. But that center of that circle, the center of the tire, does indeed have to follow a path parallel to the roadway. So that's a good um, constraint for us to use. And we'll lay our coordinate system in line with that, because then it makes things very easy. So our coordinate system uh, will be that in the x direction and then that in the y direction. And it's got to remain on the roadway there. So our initial position is such that, uh, let's see, we'll name a couple points here just for reference. There's point A. Point B is the current contact point. And that will be our angular reference line. We want to see how that line changes as the wheel moves a little bit. Um, we'll have a, a secondary reference line that we'll put at some little bit of an angle here to it, uh, just because we're not going to go through even, even uh, parts of a revolution. We want to look at some general uh, condition where we roll to any other possible position or angle. Not forgetting that there's no slip of the wheel as we go along here. All right, so that's our original setup. Uh, oh, the other thing we just need to label for uh, the sake of being obvious, is the wheel has radius r and is rolling with angular speed omega. Okay, so that's our, that's our setup there. We've got that piece. All right, at some little bit of time later, the wheel has moved to some point there. That's not bad. Those look two pretty much the same size circles. You guys, you must be in subdued state of awe. I can tell subdued because you're not standing clapping or anything. Usually when you use your head as a temple. What? What did you say? <laughs> use my head as a template? Did you want to know them? Okay, I understand what you're saying. That's okay. We'll watch the tape. All right, so it rolls to some other place where point A has now moved down to somewhere here. I'll call that A prime. And of course, B, since it's a rigid body, is still perfectly opposite that. So A went about, to, what's that, about three eighths of a turn. And so D, uh, that'll put D at the top, not for any particular reason, just so we always have some point we're looking at uh, at the bottom of the top, and we can see how things have moved. So it went through 
through that much of an angle. So A was straight up. There's its ang the angle of rotated theta. Remember, it's rotating with some angular speed omega, and that causes it to move some velocity v, uh, which is part of what we're trying to establish. We're trying to establish what is the velocity based upon the angular velocity and those kind of things. So we've got all those parts there. So uh, it moved. Don't forget, this is our origin, the original center. So it moved that far. It's moved now to point X, where that is some distance X along there. But more than that, point A has moved from uh, up there, is now located somewhere like that. So that's the position vector of point A. And A is just some general point, so we'll be able to establish that as a general condition. So let's see. The position of point A is made up of two parts. One part is uh, this component all the way out here. So that will be R, A, X. From the origin, it's the horizontal distance that uh, point A has traveled. And that is just X plus this extra little bit here farther that point A traveled. The center traveled the distance x, but point A traveled this little bit of distance farther. And that little bit of distance is r sine theta. No, r cosine theta. No, r sine theta. Let's see, it's a little hard because it's a little bit over an angle, but if it was only that far. Yeah, that's the angle, the side opposite the angle. So, plus r sine theta. See, remember what we're trying to do is establish the position of any point as a function of theta. And then we can uh, deliberate that as we need. And that's in the i direction. So that's the i component of this position vector Ra. And the x component is that little piece there, how much it's dropped below the original origin. And it, all these apply even if it was over that. Um, plus minus r, that's just simply cosine theta j. So that's the position of point A at any rotational distance of theta. We can, we can fix things up a little bit. We still have an x in there, and that's a, a little bit problematic. It would be nice if everything was a function of theta. But x is the very same distance as <coughs> this arc length here. Those are one and the same. That arc length is the same as the distance x because it's the amount of distance that was rolled out here as the piece rolled. And B went from down here to up there along that arc length. So that's, that's, what, that's our theta. So we have uh, R theta plus sine theta I. Uh, we can put the minus there. Uh, we could pull the R all the way out, I guess. Doesn't matter, it's a constant, so it's not going to be too big a deal as we go through the pieces there. Okay, so that's, that's the position 
of any point A, well, not any point A, I guess uh, uh, the, the point that started <coughs> there. Well, I guess it could be generalized to any point. What we want to find out next is what's the velocity of that point. The wheel as a whole is moving sideways with some velocity, but because of the rotational nature, there's another component to the velocity of the point A itself. And that's going to be the time derivative of that position vector, because that locates point A. Let's see, so that's uh, d r d t. But we don't have that position vector as a function of time. We have it as a function of theta. So we're going to have to do d r a d theta d theta d t. That we can do. <coughs> uh, this last little piece, that's no trouble because that's the angular velocity of the wheel, d theta dt or theta dot or omega. All right, so let's, let's take the derivative of this uh, ra, see if we can get all the pieces together. All right, so we have uh, um, r <coughs> times uh, the d theta, or that, which would be uh, this part with derivative with respect to theta, which would be 1, got to get the minus signs all right as well. Yeah, that'd be just cosine theta. That's the dr d theta of the first piece, but times d theta dt, which is simply omega. So that's dr a x d theta times d theta dt. And then that's in the I direction. Got all the pieces right? Yeah. And then the second one, it's a little bit easier because it's not a compound in any way. It's, uh, and R is a constant, so this becomes, the derivative of this with respect to theta is minus sine, becomes plus, because of the minus sign already there, R sine theta, d theta dt, which is omega, so we can put that in, and that's in the i direction. And just to clean things up a little bit, we got an r omega on each term times 1 plus cosine theta i plus sine theta j. That's just pulling the r omega out. The r omega, uh, a, sort of a familiar, familiar uh, term, so it's nice to have it out there. So there's v as a function of theta, because everything else is, uh, uh, well, if it varies with time, uh, we can take care of it in a second. Now, let's, let's see. Here's another very important point in all of this. It goes with the no-slip condition. At theta equals 180, which means the wheel has simply done half a rotation. A is now from the top all the way down to the bottom, that would be a one rotation of 180. What do we get as the velocity 
for point A? Um, theta, 180. Um, what's the cosine of 180 degrees? <coughs> Not one, negative one. So this is zero because we have one plus a negative one. So there's no I component to the velocity. And the sine of 180 degrees is zero. So the velocity of point A is zero. At, the inst at any instant, the contact point, because that's what A is after a rotation of 180 degrees, the contact point has an instantaneous velocity of zero. Anytime there's no slipping of the wheel. The contact point has an instantaneous velocity of zero. Uh, actually, I don't necessarily want an A on there. I guess I can put CP for contact point. That's going to be very useful to us uh, a little bit later and uh, actually several times here, but uh, be very, very useful in a, a couple days here, a week or two. Uh, also, though, it's one of those things that's very easy to forget. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it just seems a little counterintuitive. You feel like every point on this wheel should be moving because an instant later it's somewhere else. But if you also look at it in terms of the roadway itself, if we have the no-slip condition, this point is in contact with the road, and the road's not moving, then this point's not moving either at that instant. So as the wheel moves, the contact point moves, but this is not the, uh, this is the velocity of the wheel, and the point that just happens to be in contact with the road has zero velocity. An instant later, it doesn't. It starts, uh, uh, starts changing velocity. I didn't say it's not accelerating, I just said it has no velocity. And as you can see, it's a sign of nature as we go with that. All right, so let's, let's clean up the board a little bit. Let me put our position vector there, r times theta plus sine Wait, all I'm doing is rewriting this so I can clear some board. Minus cosine of theta j. So there, I've pulled r out. Now I'll rewrite the velocity up there, because then I'll have a little bit of room I can bring in the, uh, we can do the acceleration. So the velocity is r omega times one plus cosine theta i plus sine theta j. All right, that's just just a, a little bit of housekeeping for me up here at the board. Because now we need to deliberate that again to get the acceleration of point A, which is. Uh, the time derivative of the velocity, but we don't have it as a function of time, we have it as a function of theta, so we're going to have to do the same thing we just did. Do dv d theta d theta dt, and remember d theta dt is omega, the angular velocity. Okay, so let's, uh, let's not belabor the taking the derivative of this too much. We can get down to r times alpha plus one, quantity one plus cosine theta. Remember, we've got to do a couple chain rules in here and the like. Minus omega squared. 
sine theta. And that is the I component. When you have a little time, and those of you who love taking derivatives and trig functions and compound functions can sit down and do this. Um, and the J component plus R times alpha sine theta plus omega squared cosine theta J. Let me make sure I get all the minus signs right. I have a minus sign there, that's the only one. All right, that, that, uh, that doesn't really clean up very much, so I'll just leave that as it is. But we can now figure out what the acceleration is at 180 degrees. One plus cosine theta drops out again, as does the sine theta. So the entire I component disappears at theta equals 180. Looking at the J component, the sine component drops out. The cosine at 180 is just 1. So we have R omega squared J. omega squared j, which should look somewhat familiar. This is using our no-slip condition, also b squared over r, which is, doesn't matter if it's point A or point C, it's whatever the contact point is, at that instant, it's got a centripetal acceleration component. So there I did it for point A. Here it just happens to be for point C. So I'll call that A C prime. That's the only component of the acceleration at that instant. Which kind of makes sense. If this wheel rolls just a skosh farther, then that wheel, that contact point, There'll be a new contact point down here, but that contact point will have risen up a little bit as that edge of the wheel starts to rise up as the wheel turns. So uh, you can kind of see a piece to that. Um, this is the one we're going to need a little more often, but the, uh, this other piece is, is also important in its own right. <coughs> So now we have the whole general motion for a wheel rolling along a level surface. <coughs> Excuse me. And we did what we planned. We get r as a function of theta, and then take the derivative of that to get the velocity and the acceleration. All right. Any. Any uh, questions of delight for that? Get all the pieces? Okay, so we'll, we'll look at a couple, a uh, little bit more specific problems then. That's a pretty general problem, just the wheel rolling around the, a level surface, but it did give us that notion that the uh, contact point is um, uh, not moving at any instant in time. Okay, so let's do another problem. Imagine a circular cam. So it's a uh, Uh, it's a, essentially a, a disc, however, it's mounted off-center. It's 
center of rotation will put right there. That way you get a, a, an eccentric uh, path by each of the pieces. And there's a follower arm that rides against that at one point level with that. So there's a, a follower arm there that's you know, runs in some kind of rollers just to keep it from flopping around. And it's spring-loaded, so it remains in contact with that, uh, with that wheel. So as this wheel goes around, this arm's going to move in and out following the edge of it as that wheel, as that, uh, that cam turns. All right, we'll give it uh, a particular angular velocity and acceleration. And remember, it's about that point O. So this wheel is not rotating about its own center. It's rotating about a point uh, attached to the edge. And then that, that uh, arm is meant to follow that for whatever reason. So let's label a couple points for uh, reference. Oh, what we want to do is find the velocity and the acceleration of the rod itself. So in this case, our uh, general motion is we know that that wheel is, or that rod is constrained to move horizontally, we're just not sure how fast it's going to move in any one second. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's the picture. The end of the rod follows a straight path, we just have to figure out what it is. Alright, so it's, uh, this point is of some interest uh, as we're going. So we'll label that point B. Point A is the center. And so uh, R is the distance A0. And, okay, so we need to establish how the position of this bar as a function of the angular position of the wheel. So that's the angular position of the wheel and the position of the end of the bar at any instant is that distance x. And how that changes will give us the velocity and the acceleration. <coughs> Alright, so that's, that's our picture. So x, we need to relate to theta, and then take the derivative of that to get uh, the velocity and the acceleration. So let's see, x is um, twice this distance, which is r cosine theta. velocity of the rod will be the derivative of that. And we don't need to do it as a vector because it can only move horizontally due to the rollers. But we have x as a function of theta, not t. So this will be x d theta d theta dt. But that's omega. So we'll be able to relate its the horizontal velocity of the bar to the angular velocity of the wheel itself by doing this derivative now. So without belaboring it either, we get minus 2r sine theta 
d theta dt. This first part, that's just dx d theta. So this is minus 2r omega sine theta. So that's the velocity of the bar related to the angular velocity and the size of the wheel itself. So we can figure out something about the velocity of the bar. Then the acceleration is dv dt, but we don't have v as a function of t, we have it as a function of theta. So we have to do that with it. Uh, same kind of thing we did before. And that's a little bit more involved because I have uh, both omega and theta in the equation there. But we finish up with, oh, we can pull out r as well. Don't forget it's constant. That's the size of the wheel, not the distance from the center of rotation to the contact point with the bar. Alpha sine theta plus omega squared cosine theta. So we can pull the minus 2r out. And so that's all we're looking for on, on this piece. We established the position of the point of interest, which is uh, that contact point, but that defines where the entire bar is, as a function of theta, then take the derivative of that once and then twice to find the velocity and the acceleration. So uh, that's just sort of calculus one stuff. It's setting it up that it always takes a little bit more of a step, uh, a little bit more of an intuitive step through it. Um, but we're not going to deal with this one as much. We'll be getting to relative motion analysis a little bit quicker. Joey? Where's the alpha coming from? That, uh, when you took the derivative of this, you ended up with one part that's d omega dt. Okay. And d omega dt is alpha. Okay, so if you step through the derivative of this, you've got these two parts that are both time variant. Uh, we're not assuming this is a constant velocity rotation. We're allowing the fact that there could be acceleration. <coughs> okay, but that's all we're looking for on that point. Well, it's, uh, occasionally in the problems, they'll say, at a particular angle, what is the velocity and the acceleration? So you just put the angle in. Alan? Uh, what would change in this uh, if, the, if it wasn't a a wheel. It was like in a regular shape, like a lot of cams aren't, aren't perfect. Uh, then R wouldn't be a constant. R would change with theta as well, I guess. If, if, uh, uh, we could make it more simply though. But it, it's always going to be simpler if it's a circle, but with any cam analysis you need to know the equation of the cam itself. And so that would become uh, a part of the, and that, that would then be also a function of theta. So, uh, yeah, if, if you don't think these problems are hard enough, Alan, you feel free to make them harder. You usually do. <laughs> you usually do too. Okay, I do. I don't. That's well, at some point these are going to get harder. Uh, no, we're we're going to do uh, another one or two of these, and then we'll get on to the relative motion analysis which generally is more useful and students find it a little easier. I do. This, this kind of, uh, you know, well, the der taking the derivative of trig functions is always confusing, uh, I think. You've got minus signs and, and trig changes and all kinds of stuff going on. But uh, just setting up, getting that first part, you get the first step and you're fine. It's just sometimes that's the hardest part of these problems. Uh, it's been my experience for the students, and uh, was my experience going through these classes. So, we'll do another one. Uh,
a garage door opener type problem. So we have a, a door hinged at one point and supported by uh, an actuator of some kind, a, a piston, if you wish, that goes up to the midpoint. So that's a, uh, maybe a hydraulic piston of some kind that opens and closes the door. And it's attached at the midpoint of the door, which is a meter on either side. And the cylinder extends at a rate of uh, half a meter per second. Yeah. So that's actually then the speed of the middle of the door, not the velocity, because as the door opens these angles are going to change. That's the speed of the middle of the door and then uh, we can figure out then what the what this rest of the door is doing. We want to find actually the angular velocity and acceleration of the door at theta equals 30 degrees, where theta is uh, the amount of the, the angle at which the door is open. So the one point that's traveling along a prescribed path is the center of the door and it's going to go along a circular path like that of radius one meter as the, as the pneumatic cylinder extends. And uh, so we can set up a, a triangle based on that if we let that be the origin, call that point A and this point B. So we have the, the speed of point B. That's the 0.5 meters per second if we needed it. So remember we've got to establish that um, where that point is is a function of theta and then take the derivative of that to get omega and alpha uh, and as they follow. So let's do this as well. We'll call the uh, the length of the actuator, that distance AB, which is variable by the 0.5 meters per second. We'll just call that S for uh, abbreviations sake, because now we have a triangle whose sides and angles we can relate with the um, uh, law of cosines. So that's uh, um, oh no, OA is the is the side of yeah. I already got, I already have that built in there. I think. So the distance AO or OA square. Well, that's that's just two meters because that's where the the door is when it's closed. I guess I should should show that as well. So this, uh, <coughs> these distances here are also one meter. So we know that AO, um, and then the law of cosines, AO squared plus BO squared minus 2A2. A O B O cosine theta. Does that look like the law of cosines for that triangle? Let me make sure I got all my minus signs right. Yeah, we're okay. 
And this is <coughs> two meters squared because that's a fixed distance, A to O. And B O is also a fixed distance. Uh, that's one meter. So those two together is two meters squared because those are fixed distances. So we just have the theta. We now have S as a function of theta, which is the first step we needed in all of these. The position of the door, which is this distance, S, A, B. The position of the door, the position of that prescribed point that establishes where the door is and is following a circular path. And then we can now take the derivative of that to find the velocity and the acceleration of the door and do it at a particular point there so we can, we can do these. Easier said than done, of course. With those values put in and taking the square root, because we want s, not s squared, uh, it simplifies to 5 minus 4 cosine theta. That's putting in the values 1 meter, 2 meters as, as needed and simplifying. Okay, so we need to take the derivative of these. So the velocity of that point is ds dt which is ds d theta, d theta dt, there's our omega. So we can take the derivative of that. I know you guys want to be doing all these trig derivatives yourself. I'm kind of stealing the great fun of this particular class for you. Let's see, it's square rooted, so the power comes down. We get the same quantity. Power reduced by one. It was to the one half power. When we take the derivative of that, it reduces the power by one, and then times the derivative of the quantity inside, which is my, the the five minus four cosine theta. Five is a constant, so we get the derivative of the cosine, which is minus the sine. That becomes a plus times d theta d. which is omega. That look right? <coughs> I think that's all the parts we've got. We can simplify this even more. Uh, we're going to see this is omega. What isn't as obvious is that little piece there is 1 over s, because that was s there. And that's to uh, the minus one half coefficient. So we can simplify that even a little bit more. It becomes two sine theta. Remember, we gotta take the derivative of this, so the simpler we get it, the simpler we can make it. And so that all reduces, uh, I believe, to two sine theta. Yeah, because the one half, one half times the four, leaves us the sine theta omega. So that's pretty simple. And we can evaluate that at 30 degrees. If we wanted to leave it in general terms, we'd leave it like that. Um, oh, we already know what this is because this is the velocity of that Point, at the speed of that point B. So at 30 degrees, actually at any time, let's put it this way, that equals the 0.5 meters per second that the, that bit of door is moving. Remember that V, this S is all set up on where that point B is and how fast it's moving. So now we can find 
what omega equals at 30 degrees by just solving that, and it's uh, 0.62 radians per second. Just putting in 30 degrees and solving for omega. Nothing magical about the 30 degrees, just a chance for us to put some numbers in and, and see what the values are. But based on the speed of that point B, we now have the angular speed of the entire door. So we've got S, we've got B. We now need the acceleration. So we'll take the derivative again. We don't have V as a function of T, we have it as a function of theta, but we, we've been doing that whole thing along uh, as we go along here. So the factor omega is going to come back into this one again, uh, as it has before. All right, so we're now taking the derivative of this piece here. So that'll be 2 sine theta over s times, uh, that's just this quantity times the derivative of that quantity, quantity which is omega dot, which is d omega dt uh, or alpha. So there's our acceleration component in there. plus 2 omega s cosine theta dot, no wait, that's not right, cosine theta times theta dot. That's d, uh, sorry, d theta dt. That's just this piece on there again. So this is what we're doing is, the, of course, the uh, the uh, the chain rule business. The thing is, we have theta, omega, and s are all time variant. So that's why this one's getting kind of uh, strung out a little bit. We've got these three parts going into it. Two omega sine theta over minus s squared. That's not minus s quantity squared, that's s squared minus. So that minus stays with there. And then ds dt, which is uh, v, which we already have. So that's the whole schmear of that piece, the whole derivative of that. It's multi-part, because remember we've got three parts in here that are all time variant. S, theta, and omega are all changing with time. So, um, we can then put all of these pieces together. This is S double dot, if you would rather. Oh, we can, re we can, we can simplify this a little bit. Uh, that may help. So this is, 2 alpha sine theta s because alpha is d omega dt. The second part here, that uh, d theta dt is omega, so we have an omega squared. This becomes 2 omega squared over s cosine theta and then the last piece, the, the little piece on the end, that gets real easy. That's minus v squared because notice we have 2 omega sine theta s 
to a, oh no, not v squared, it's v over s squared. So what we get is v squared over s. So that takes care of the extra s there. So that's a little simpler. And we've got all the pieces then. So um, then we can uh, evaluate it at 30 degrees. Then the acceleration is minus 415 radians per second squared. Oh, wait, that's got to be alpha. No, that's, that's a, oh dear, s dot in radians per second squared, so something, well, you can check it. Your, your eyes haven't glossed over yet, have they? Anthony, you're loving this? Did you take into account DSCT when you introduce it to v squared over s? <coughs> Which part? Last uh, factor. Here? Uh, yeah, that's that's right here. Okay. The STT. You took that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what that's what uh, this is. Okay. That's V. Okay, so uh, I don't know if this is A. I think this I think this is supposed to be meters per second, not radians per second. Uh, but you can double check it when you pull the pieces together. <coughs> when you sit down and go through this. <coughs> All right. Uh, two hard parts. One is just establishing the original position equation. Uh, I've erased it. It was the 1 over s of that part. Uh, then the hard part, you got to derivate it with respect to time and get all the pieces right. You can't, you can't lose any minus signs or squares. or. That just gets to be complicated. So we're not going to make a big deal about this one. This is this is uh, uh, a much more of an academic exercise than is the relative motion, which students generally tend to gather better and enjoy more because of that. So was that a question, Alan? I was just looking at the derivative and saying that if it's if the derivative of the velocity with respect to time is the same exact thing as velocity with respect to theta times theta with respect to time, and theta with respect to time is omega, then you should be able to replace You that. mean this, this step here? No, or the or acceleration, right here. there. If you erase d theta of dt and put omega in its yeah. place, then the answer you get is a lot simpler. It's only like the second term of that whole thing. Just this? Down, down one more, right there. But these these terms drop out? Well, if you have to do it wrong. If you just if that's the velocity over there, two sine theta over s omega, then you take the derivative of that and then multiply it. When you're done, multiply it times omega, and you got two omega squared cosine theta over s. Well, it can't be right because you've lost these two terms. Because don't forget, even though you have omega here, uh, it is time variant as well. And you have that on uh, the d theta dt um, on each of the terms. Is your a the, is your answer in the right form? It says a equals negative point four one five h per second. Should that be alpha equals? No, I think. Uh, well, we're, oh, we we're looking for alpha. So yeah, I bet that is alpha. So I had the units right, the symbol wrong. And you uh, yeah, you, that makes more sense. And you made sure when you calculated, you didn't put it 30 degrees to put it uh, over 6 radians. Oh, yeah, you don't do this in, in you don't, well, when you're doing it on your calculator, you can do sine of 30 degrees. Okay. Um, you know, you set your calculator appropriately if you're putting in degrees or if you're putting in radians. It's just most people, I don't know about you guys, I can picture what degrees are, angles and degrees are, much better than I can in radians. So, uh, that was just, you know, an arbitrarily chosen value for that. 
All right, so hopefully that scared you off. Absolute motion analysis well enough. A couple homework problems. Do your best with them. Uh, but we'll do most of what we do with the relative motion analysis. So we'll establish that next. You'll find that a lot easier, I think. Which means, so do I. So this stuff kind of makes my head split. I, I like the, the real stuff a little bit better, which the relative motion analysis seems to be a bit more. And there are some problems that can be done either way. So uh, if you're not specifically given a way to do it, then, then don't, uh, don't worry about it. So first, a little bit of a reminder on relative motion. We've already talked about it before. But if we have two points, A and B, and some arbitrary origin, then we can locate the two vectors, or those two points, with their position vectors R A and R B. And the relative position vector, this is just a reminder, because we've done this before, the relative position vector <coughs> B relative to A. If you're sitting at point A, where do you have to look and how far away do you have to look? to find point B, and that's what this vector describes, the direction you look and the distance you'd have to look to find point B, is defined as the difference of the two position vectors. Remember my, uh, my uh, offering that it's with those subscripts in the same order, B, A, B, A and then you can always get the, the vector in the right position with that. And then the relative velocity vector is the derivative of that, which just becomes the difference in the velocities of the two. And the subscripts still keep the same order as they did before. So if we know something about the motion of one point on a rigid body, we can keep, we can get an idea of the motion of another point. Don't forget, on a rigid body, the distance between any two points is a constant. So we'll use that. Uh, it doesn't matter which order I put that in. But it's this fact that the distance between the two is a constant. Now, what that means, if we've got some rigid body, and it's got these two points, A and B on it, and we know something about how point A is moving. Let's uh, just for example say, say point A moves along that path. Then we can figure out more about how point B is moving using this relative motion. Here's the idea. Don't forget we're looking at generalized motion so there's translation as well as rotation. So not only is this object moving along here because point A is moving along that path, but it's turning as well. So some little bit of time later, I guess it would do that, just because of way A, where A is. So some little bit of time later, point A, having followed along that path, but because of the rotation, point B 
is now down here. And we can figure out the position of point B and particularly the velocity and the acceleration of point B if we know something about the motion of point A and the relative motion of the two between them. So uh, if we're looking for the velocity of B, that means solve for this, that's going to be the velocity of A plus the velocity of B relative to A. That's just solving this velocity equation for BB. I'm trying to figure out something about the velocity of point B. The whole object is moving along and it's rotating, so there's some complex, more complex notion of the velocity of B at this one point than there, uh, there is to point A, because point A is just following along that line, that constrained line of some kind. So this is the piece that we need to figure out how that business works. And here's the simple idea that will give it to us. That's the velocity of B relative to A. If you're sitting at point A, what does it look like B is doing? That's what this question is. That's what this term is. B relative to A. You're sitting at A. You're looking out at B. What does it look like B is doing? If you're just looking out at B, you're not looking at anything else. You're looking out at B. You see B is off in that direction at first. You're looking that way at B. A little bit later, you're looking that way at B. And then sometime later, maybe point A is moved to here, point B is over here. You notice, as you sit at point A, that point B never gets any farther away from you. Is that true? Yeah, it's a rigid body. That's our definition of a rigid body, that none of the distances between any arbitrary points will change. So you're sitting at point A, you look out at point B and you notice it's not getting any farther away, but it is moving always to the side. It looks, as a matter of fact, like it's orbiting you, doesn't it? No matter what that object does, if you're sitting at point A, it looks like point B is orbiting around you. You happen to be moving as well, but when you're sitting at point A and you don't sense that movement or you don't pay attention to it, you're just looking at point B, it looks like B is just orbiting around you. Of course, you are all young enough, you think the world over orbits around you anyway, if not the whole universe. But here's, uh, here's actual justification for that. Are we saying A to not be turning then? A is just a point. So A is not on the body? A is on the body. It's right there. The body later turns, now A is right there, now A is right there. The thing that we're saying is that we, we know something about that velocity, of the velocity of point A. That tells us what the whole body's moving. When we were doing particle analysis, we'd only look at part A and say the whole object is doing that. But now we know the object is turning around it. I don't know which particular direction, it looks like maybe it's that direction. But you can't say point A is or isn't turning because point A is just a point. It has no dimension. Points to have no dimension. So uh, point A is going along a known path. The rigid body is also rotating around it in some way. And we're trying to figure out what the velocity of point B is due to the motion of A and the fact that the object itself is turning. Is that okay, Chris? So it's not a reference frame like on the body, it's like no way when you add it. No, the, the only time you're worried about the reference frame on the body is when you're trying to figure out what this is, because this is relative motion, B's relative motion to A. So in this case, your reference frame is point A. But no, we don't consider that reference frame to be turning. 
the, uh, the reason this is good is we already know that. That's, a, as far as point A is concerned, this is pure rotation. And so, if we know the velocity of point A, we can add to it the fact that, relatively speaking, the object is rotating about point A. And we've already looked at that. We looked at that last Friday. That's omega cross omega AB, which is the angular velocity of the body <coughs> times the relative position vector. And that we've already looked at. We looked at that uh, back in the, uh, the earlier parts. So if we want to know how B, B is moving, we look at how A is moving, because that determines where the whole object is going. But we also look at how the object is turning around point A as point A moves itself. And so we can figure out now the velocity of B with the relative motion analysis. <clears throat> Here's another point that students often forget. Notice I, I didn't bother to put a slash between this. When we have any rigid body, with any number of points on it that we can connect. So if I had an A, a B, and a C, and this object has some angular speed, that angular speed is the same for any of these lines. They all have the same angular speed. Students sometimes forget this. This angular velocity is for the entire body and any reference line we can scribe on it. So all of these pieces are also rotating with angular velocity omega. Where the center of rotation is, we don't know. It doesn't matter if that body has that angular velocity, any part of that body also has that angular velocity. So this is a much easier number to come up with than students a lot of times think. They, they think this often is something different they have to determine. Uh, if you're told the angular velocity of one part of the body, you know the angular velocity of the entire part of the body. Okay, so we'll draw it to a close there, and we'll put this to work on Friday. Given the velocity of A and how the object is turning, we'll be able to find the velocity of any other point, and then, of course, the acceleration as well. So, boy, if that's not interesting enough to get you back on Friday, what could be?